Let's talk about center of mass. It's also called center of gravity. We can use the terms interchangeably. Uh, for our purposes here on planet Earth, there really is no difference. So this mass, or this block, excuse me, this block has mass, and the mass is distributed throughout the block. This block is of uniform density, pretty much, and it's uniform thickness. It's a nice uh, geometric shape, a rectangular, a rectangular shape. And although there's mass distributed evenly throughout the object, there is a point at which all of the mass seems to be. We call that the center of mass. And for a nice, uh, regularly shaped object like this, it's at the geometric center. So you see, I've drawn two diagonals, and where they intersect marks the center of the block, and I can support all of the weight of the block at its center of mass. So going with our definition, the center of mass is the point at which where all the mass seems to be, I can support the block everywhere just by supporting it at the center of mass. Also, a block, this block or any object rotates about its center of mass. So you can, as I rotate this block, you can see that it's spun about that point, the center of mass. And actually, the center of mass is inside the block at that spot in the very center, but here my point of support is directly below the center of mass. And if I hung the block, its center of mass would fall directly below the support point. Here I've got a metal plate and it has two holes in it. I'll hang the metal plate from a support from one of the holes and the center of mass is somewhere vertically in line below the point of support. And if I rotate the object so that the center of mass is not below this uh, point of support, it swings back and we know eventually it will come to rest like that. So if I hang a weight by a string, now I know which way is directly down and I can mark the line that's directly below the point of support. So I'll take my pen and I'll draw a line and I know my center mass is somewhere on that line and now I'm going to support the weight or support the plate through another point and again we see it will come to rest so that the center of mass is directly below the point of support. I'll put my hang my string again and where those lines intersect that's going to be where my center of mass is. And if I take my plate and put my hands right at that point, I can balance the plate at the center of mass. So here I've built, built myself a little seesaw type of thing, and I've hung two weights on this side, each of 500 grams, and two weights on this side, each of 500 grams. And this setup is very symmetrical. I've got the same amount of stuff on this side that I do on this side. If you drew a line right down the middle, the left side and the right side look exactly the same. So as we might expect, the center of mass of a symmetrical system is right in the center. You can see on my meter stick, the balancing point is at the 50 centimeter mark. So I know that my system here the center of mass is right here above the point of support, which is the top of this pyramid. Now what I can do is I can replace two objects with one object. Remember the center of mass is the point at which where all the mass seems to be. So that means of these two objects, its center of mass is right in the middle. So I can replace these two 500 gram masses with one 1000 gram mass located in between those two points and it should still have the same overall center of mass for the whole system. Let's try it. So here is my 1000 gram mass. I'm going to go ahead and take off
move the string to the center of where, in between where they were before, and hang my 1,000 gram mass. And this setup is very sensitive, just a, a millimeter or two off, and it really makes a difference. And there we go. So I replaced two 500 gram masses that were at 30 and 40 centimeters away from the fulcrum or the pivot point. And uh, now it balances with a thousand grams, th the same as two 500s together, located at the center of mass of the two 500 gram masses, which is at the 35 centimeter point. So what we can do is use this example to show when we find the center of mass mathematically, we can break down our system and use symmetry to our advantage, and we can take two masses, combine them to one, at, acting at their center of mass, and we can keep doing that with all the particles of a system until we get down to two particles, and the center of mass will be between the two particles. And we're gonna show you mathematically how to calculate that. So let's start off with a simple example, finding the center of mass between two objects. So each object is going to have mass. We'll call those uh, m1 and m2, the mass of object 1 and the mass of object 2. And the distance from m1 to the center of mass, since we've placed m1 at the origin and m2 on the x-axis, we'll call it x sub com for center of mass. So this distance from the first mass to the point at which all the mass seems to be, the center of mass, we'll call that x com. And an easy way of thinking of it is what is the mass of M2 as a percentage of the total mass? So we know that ratio would be M2 all over M2 plus M1. What is the ratio or the percentage of M2 of the total mass? Now you can think of the center of mass, the distance from M1 to the center of mass is that same percentage. So the, for two objects, the distance to the center of mass is the percentage of M2, the further mass away, over the total mass times the distance between them. And that will give us this distance here, x com. And that works well uh, if we put one uh, mass number one at the origin. And if M1 and M2 have the same mass, then this ratio, of course, will be 0.5. And as we expect, the center of mass will be 0.5d, or halfway between the two masses. That's straightforward if one of the masses is at the origin, but for a more general situation where the masses could be anywhere on the x-axis, neither one is at the origin, and we know that the center of mass between the two masses is still calculated the same way as before, but now that center of mass is offset from the origin by this distance x1, which is the distance from the origin to the first mass. So the new x-coordinate of the center of mass is the offset distance x1 plus the distance between them. You can pause the video here if you like and follow along the algebra, but it comes down to the center of mass between two masses on the x-axis the x-coordinate of the center of mass is equal to the first mass times its x-coordinate plus the second mass times its x-coordinate, all divided by the total mass, capital M, which is the sum of M1 and M2. Now let's assume we have more than two particles, n particles. So what we'll first do is we'll find the center of mass between M1 and M2, just like we did before, and here's the equation for it, and then we'll treat the center of mass as one particle comprising of mass M1 plus M2. And then we'll find the center of mass between that and M3. And then we'll do it again using the center of mass of those three and the center of mass of M4. And we'll keep combining them down into a point mass and, combine, and finding the center of mass with the next particle all the way out to the nth particle. So here I show the algebra to, to find the center of mass between 
the center of mass of 1 and 2 together plus m3. Again, you can pause the video and look at the algebra if you want to. But it comes down to the same form of the equation. The x-coordinate of the first mass times its mass plus the x-coordinate of the second times its mass plus the x-coordinate of the third times its mass divided by the sum of all the masses together. So in general, we can write it this way. The x-coordinate of the center of mass is equal to 1 over the total mass times the sum of all the terms mi, xi, where i is 1, so m1, x1, then 2, plus m2, x2, then 3, plus m3, x3, and so on, all the way up to n terms. So here it is in the long form, and this is the compact short form. For n particles, all located along a single axis, find their center of mass. So, of course, that would be a rare instance that all our particles that we're finding the center of mass of lie along the same axis. It's far more expected that the particles will be distributed uh, throughout two- or three-dimensional space. So it, it's not a, a difficult um, calculation to extend this to two dimensions. All you do is, uh, here we show an example of two particles in two-dimensional space in the xy plane, and each particle has coordinates x comma y. All you do is you treat all the particles as if they were along the x-axis, and you apply your equation for the center of mass for particles along the x-axis to give you the x-coordinate of the center of mass. Then you treat all the particles as if they were along the y-axis, and you apply the same equation, but now in the y-direction, and your uh, answers give you the x and y coordinate of the center of mass of your collection of particles. And if we add the z direction, we just do the same method as we did for the y-axis. We use the z coordinates of all our particles in three-dimensional space now, and m1, z1 plus m2, z2 divided by the total mass to get our z coordinate in three-dimensional space of our center of mass location, xcom, comma, ycom, comma, zcom. So let's talk about some strategies we can use to more easily find the center of mass of any object. So number one, let's of course use symmetry to our advantage. As we said before, if we can break objects down into symmetrical sections, we know that center of mass will be somewhere in the middle. In one dimension, in the middle will be a point. In two dimensions, in the middle will be a line. So the center of mass of this symmetrical triangle will be somewhere on this line. And in three dimensions, it'll be somewhere in the plane that divides the symmetrical sections. Here you see uh, this staircase is symmetrical. The piece that's in front of the plane and the piece that's in back of the plane are symmetrical. So somewhere in that orangish plane will be the center of mass of this staircase. And let's break down objects by section. And within each section, if we can find the center of mass of that section, then we can treat that section as a point mass. And then our object is a collection of point masses that we can find the center of mass of. And let's also make sure we choose our axes and our origin wisely so as to simplify our calculations. So let's look at an example using our strategies to find the center of mass of this L-shaped object. So I'm going to break it down into sections and treat each section as a point mass located at, its, at that respective section's center of mass. And I'm also going to break them down break it down into symmetrical sections so that the center of mass of each section can easily be found because it is symmetrical. So I've chosen to break it down into two rectangles. So this one large rectangle here and this smaller second rectangle here, each of which I know the center of mass of those rectangles is at its center, which is very easy to find. So now uh, these two rectangles, I can treat them as two point masses one of them located here, 
and one of them located here. And then the center of mass between those two points, I use my equations for uh, point masses at finding the center of mass. Let's look at another example. Let's find the center of mass of an equilateral triangle. We'll do it two ways. First of all, we'll use the symmetry of this object to find its center of mass. An equilateral triangle, of course, is symmetrical. So I, see, I know the center of mass lies somewhere on this line because the left side and the right side are exactly the same. So the line that divides them, the center of mass is somewhere on that line. And if I do it again using this vertex of the triangle as the top, then this line divides it down the middle and the center of mass must be somewhere on that line. And if I repeat the process using this vertex as the top of the triangle, the center of mass lies somewhere along this line. And of course, this point that I've labeled P4 is the only point that is on all three of those lines. So that must be where the center of mass is. And we call that point geometrical center of the equilateral triangle. What are its coordinates? Well, if we let each side of the triangle be one, then of course the x coordinate is half of one or one half. And using this triangle right here, knowing that equilateral triangles have angles of 60 degrees in their vertices, then this bisects that angle. So this is 30 degrees and this side of the triangle is one half. So using uh, a third, the ratios of sides of a 30, uh, 60, 90 triangle. And if this side is one half, then this side right here must be root three over six. Here's the calculation for that. So the coordinates of my center of mass of my equilateral triangle will have a coordinate of center of mass of one half comma root three over six. Let's see if using our equation for center of mass agrees. So first of all, I'm going to take each side of the triangle. This is a, you can imagine this is like a, a dinner bell, uh, a triangle that they would ring to call you for dinner uh, on a ranch. Each side of the triangle, its center point is where that side of the triangle's center of mass is. So this is a problem where I would find the center of mass of a collection of three points one located at P1 and having mass of the length of one side, we'll call that M, and a point at P2 having mass M and a point at P3 having mass M. So I need to know the coordinates of those points, P1, P2, and P3. P1 is halfway between zero and P3. We know P3 is at X equals one half, so that's one fourth. And uh, using our 30, 60, 90 triangles again, we can figure out that if this hypotenuse is one, this leg of the triangle is root three over two. So halfway down is root three over four. So there's my coordinate of point P1, and then my X coordinate of P2 is one half plus one quarter or three quarters, and the same Y coordinate as P1, root three over four, and P3 is an easy one to find, just one half comma zero. So those are the coordinates of P1, P2, and P3. Now I use those coordinates in my equation for XCOM and YCOM. You can pause the video here to follow the algebra along, but I've just taken these X coordinates and plugged them into the equation to come up with my X coordinate of the COM. And I use my Y coordinates, root three over four, root three over four and zero, plug them into the equation to come up with my Y COM, and then my X comma Y of my center of mass is one half comma root three over six, the same as I got using uh, the symmetry method.